we got you all set up? Oh, okay, so that's right, because Ralph's not going to use any slides. So Ralph McNall, WB2DCL, <laughs> Trials and Tribulations of Integrating a Yezu DR1X into an Analog Repeater System. There it is. Okay, okay here good. we go. Uh, anyways, um... Several years back, my youngest boy gave me a Bofang to get me back into amateur radio. Back in the late 60s, when I got my license in the early 60s, uh, I was involved with the Buffalo Amateur Radio Repeater Association, which uh, um, basically had a two-meter repeater I was using that was convenient near where I was. It was actually linked into a number of other repeaters. Uh, today, that system has grown to... Um, uh, a two meter repeater uh, linked into a 10 meter repeater, linked into a 220 repeater, linked into a 440 repeater, and that 440 repeater's got six remotes on it. So when I got back involved with Barra, they had just uh, uh, several members had recently purchased a uh, uh, ICOM um, D Star uh, system, both the 2 and the 440. They had them um, linked together by the controller, they had it on the internet, but they didn't have it linked into the, our analog system. So I thought at that time, uh, Yasu was offering the uh, DR1X for $500, and I basically went to uh, the head of our technical committee, uh, Ted Ertl, WA2HKS, whose calls on the 440 machine, and asked, you know, would you be interested in having me, uh, if I got one of these, what, could we integrate it into the system? And uh, he said, yeah, I'll work with you on that. So uh, I, I got the DR1X. And it sat in his basement for probably six to nine months uh, as we worked on uh, getting it integrated in and how to do it. So the first decision uh, he came up with, which was interesting, was uh, why don't we have it listen on the same frequency that his 444 analog machine is listening on, it's, which is 449. Uh, we can use the same antenna for the, you know, feed for that. So um, he, he came up with some control circuitry for doing that. But then we had to figure out, okay, so how do we interface this into the Fusion? Um, if you're familiar with it, it you know, there's a DB15 on the back. It's got a whole bunch of signals coming out of it. One of the things it doesn't necessarily have, and we're not exactly sure about this still, is an indication of, you know, that it's actually receiving a, a digital signal. And it, um, so what we did is, is we went in and tapped the uh, push-to-talk uh, signal between the receiver and the transmitter in the DR1X, uh, actually I built up a little adapter initially for doing that. It took a little bit of effort to get the, find the connectors, but I was able to do it. And so they didn't actually have to cut into the cable, which would void the warranty if I needed to return it. <laughs> um, so we used that for a while. We had some problems later on. I ended up taking it out after a year and a half and actually hardwiring hard it. So that got us the push the um, push to talk signal. We were running it in digital mode. It wasn't, doing, it wasn't doing AMS, it was just in digital mode, and that push-to-talk goes live when it has a decoded digital signal. So that provided a state signal to put back into the controller for the overall system, um, for let it know that we had a, a, um, a YSF signal, that it could uh, take the analog output from the DB15 and then feed into the system to actually provide um, a decoded version of the digital signal for uh, feeding the rest of the analog system. The, uh, we, en we ended up taking the repeater off of the shared input frequency and putting it on its own frequency because we were running into issues where it would not, um, we occasionally have an analog signal that was there for, and a digital signal simultaneously. Well, we get a digital signal, but this, for some reason the system still thought it was in, in analog mode, and that was preventing it from switching over uh, properly. So we, f we basically fixed that by, mo by moving it. But the, the other problem we ran into is <sighs> Yasu has incomplete and misleading documentation with res respect to the signals going in and out of the DB15. Specifically, not only for the DR1X, but for the DR2X. It specifically states that, you know, uh, you can't put a signal into, the, into that you know, analog input and have it get converted into a YSF C4 FM signal. That's not true. You can. If it's in digital mode, it'll get converted. Okay. Um, but the other thing you have to take into consideration is what we still are fighting with to a certain extent is that's, that input is intended basically, and the reason the way it's documented is, is that input is intended primarily for, you know, 
doing a uh, having a packet modem connected up to it and uh, you know supporting packet and things and it's it could, another FM you know uh, digital modes but um, what the, you know so but when it's in digital mode that signal goes off to the to the uh, DSP and the problem is is that <laughs> Ted initially set set up the uh, input level by um, basically feeding an audio signal into um, the audio inline, having it in FM mode and checking the deviation. So he set the audio level to provide, uh, you know, the, the standard 100% deviation, for, you know, in FM mode. That way overdrove the digital. And when you overdrive the digital, what happens is, is you get all these ones, and all the ones cause problems for the codec. And I, sus I still don't know for sure, but I suspect what it does is it drops that particular um, uh, s section of the input and just keeps repeating what was before. But anyways, it generates very nasty um, uh, digital signals. It's much worse than just clipping. And if, you've, if you have digital and you're working with you know, any of them, uh, but particularly Yasu, Yasu allows you to change the uh, volume levels on your mics and that. And uh, you know, a common comment is, is you're overdriving, cut your mic game back. Um, and that's basically what we're dealing with right now. We from the original level, we're now down to probably about 30% of that for the drive level. And the other thing that's important is, is that that input is not filtered from a frequency response perspective. And while the AMBI spec is 300 to 3,000, we stuck a sine wave generator on it one day and started cranking it down from a kilohertz. And when we got to 550 hertz, it just went bananas. <laughs> so... Um, Basically, the, uh, codec, the codecs are really sensitive to what they're getting, and you don't want to have a, uh, basically an overdriven signal going into them. And that's my quick presentation. Great. Thank you very much.